Hello and welcome back to the Walking Dead Retrospective, where today we'll be finally delving into the last act of All Out War, and finally putting an end to the arduous journey that is Season 8. Luckily, the final stretch is, in my opinion at least, by far the strongest portion of the season, so there is plenty of good stuff to talk about. But without further ado, let us dive right in. When we left off, Negan's siege on the hilltop had already happened, so let's catch up on the TV version where things play out quite similarly, but also quite differently at the same time. First things first, nothing about the attack is unexpected. In fact, the hilltop has already prepared tire spikes and everything in anticipation of Negan's next attack. Similarly, like I already mentioned with Negan and Rick last time, they once again chit-chat over the radios a whole bunch before the attack even opens. Another huge difference here is that Negan is not even here, and it's Simon leading the entire charge instead because Negan is taken by Jadis, but no one cares about that. I've mentioned it a million times and I'll say it again, I absolutely love Trevor's character and considering he already had personal beef with the Hilltop, I think this was a great change for the show. Especially with him being far more of a loose cannon than Negan ever was. As for the rest of the attack, big surprise, this is a nighttime shoot, so this is also easily one of my favorite big battles of All Out War. And I also think it perfectly captures the horror that I feel like has been missing ever since Negan's first lineup. There are a few more differences sprinkled throughout, like Tara getting shot in the arm by Dwight instead of Rick, which is a subtle change, sure, but one I would have really liked to see adapted, mostly because of the absolute turmoil it puts Rick through by the end of the war. Of course, in the show he has lost Carl, and based on what would play out next, I'm guessing they just didn't want to weaken Rick, which I do think also makes sense. And more on that in just a second. In terms of notable injuries slash deaths, Tobin takes Nicholas's role from the comics and is sliced with an infected knife. For those of you who haven't really gone down the Walking Dead rabbit hole, Tobin does have a bit of a cult following in the community and has rightfully earned the title of the GOAT background character. He first appeared in episode 13 of season 5, so he has literally been around for years, and with him occasionally getting some important story beats with Carol and the others, I do think that his death hit quite a bit harder than Nicholas in the book, at least for most people. But the wider attack mostly plays out exactly like the book, except for the initial breach of the gates. They lure the saviors in, blind them with massive floodlights, and ambush them, forcing them to fall back immediately. And with all that said, I think the siege on Hilltop was basically exactly what I wanted to see in the TV version. And the way it uses the clear advantages that a live-action format brings to up the horror of this entire battle was excellent. I especially love this scene. The almost deafening silence as Simon begins their, at this point, signature whistling, only for them to get annihilated is a very nice inversion of the lineup initially. also signifying the massive turning point that this battle turns out to be. So, once again, very very good. And that nicely leads us into the fallout of this horror ordeal. In the book, the following morning people are already getting sick. And when the survivors find the gunked up weapons, they piece together Negan's plan, which, not surprisingly, also stuns the entirety of the Grimes family since Rick 2 was supposedly shot by one of the infected bolts. This part is crucial, so keep that in mind for a moment. And while you do, YouTube tells me that a whole bunch of you are not subscribed to the channel, and apparently if I ask you nicely, you might. So, um, please do, it helps out a ton, and like the video while you're at it. Hey Susan, do you really want me to include this? It's really, really cringe. Anyway, in the meantime, we cut over to Negan and the Saviors, who have set up camp just outside of the hilltop. And here, we get a brief conversation between him and Dwight where we basically see them clash a little as Negan says that Dwight should at least try to hide some of his disdain, clearly revealing the fact that Negan is still fully aware that Dwight hates him. But because this is Negan's MO after all, he says that he gets it and that things are going too well for him to get angry now. Finally saying that Rick is the one who ruined everything and with him now succumbing to the gunked up bolts, it's only a matter of time before they roll up to the hilltop and get things back in line. And they also have a lookout tell them that Eugene has been spotted rolling up to the hilltop, but since Negan is so confident and is just playing the long game, he says that it frankly does not matter and when they retake hilltop, he'll be forced to work for them regardless. 
As for the show, in as few words as possible, I think Angela Kang and Matt Negret absolutely knocked it out of the park with what happens here. Obviously, the comic version has that huge twist that Rick might be infected, which is not present in the show. But aside from that, I think they took Kirkman's idea of these gunked up weapons and absolutely ran with the idea. And this is, admittedly, one of very few instances in All Out War where, in my opinion, the show far surpassed the source material. In the book, the whole turning aspect was already revealed to us when the survivors find the weapons. Whereas in the show, none of that is known at this point. And so, once night falls, we are plunged into absolute horror as the people start turning, and it quickly turns into an absolute bloodbath. Much of this is very clearly evoking the sickness arc in the prison, and perhaps not surprisingly, Matt Negret was also a writer on Indifference way back in Season 4, so he might have taken some inspiration there. And in a broader sense, the fact that we do very much see the seemingly peaceful morning after, only for us to yet again be dropped into this nightmare just makes this whole thing hit that much harder. Because sure, we had some people injured, but the joint forces withstood the attack and things were looking up. Only for this Trojan horse tactic to go off and wipe out a whole bunch of people in the process. To be fair, the only death here that I think is actually relevant is Tobin, so it's not like it's some huge emotion bomb for us either. But still, the horror in the entire sequence is a perfect example of why I will always champion adaptations of any kind. As I've said before, many of them absolutely missed the mark. But when they get it right, they take something that might have seemed intense on paper and turn it into one of the most terrifying sequences of the war. And yes, this is a nighttime shoot, so even more bonus points for that. And that's not even mentioning the absolutely incredible character moments we get in this one. Basically, every scene we get with Rick here is just pure perfection. Everything from him joining the fray in their counterattack on the Saviors, to that morning after scene with Michonne, to him loading his revolver while talking to Sadiq, clearly hinting at that killer instinct that has been reawakened in him, all of them were just straight up excellence. Ditto for Morgan, who too is spiraling back into his clear persona as he starts getting visions of Gavin and goes all out during the savior attack. We'll get to Rick and Morgan specifically in just a moment, but to sum it all up, I think episode 13 is a perfect example of how to write quote unquote filler and make it seem absolutely seamless. Instead of adding an entirely new group that turns out to be completely irrelevant, just take what was there in the source material and spin it into something more. The whole turning surprise was there, but wasn't expanded on, and that is exactly what the show took advantage of. It dove deeper into what that would mean for the survivors and, in my opinion, gave us one of the greatest episodes in All Out War. Returning to the book for a bit though, like we heard from the Savior Lookout, Eugene and Carson have made it to the hilltop and we see them reunite with Rick and the others. Obviously, seeing the gates in the state of the community, Eugene's first reaction is just, what happened? And importantly, he also tells them that he brought all the ammo he could and also considered destroying the equipment they had but then saying that he just couldn't bring himself to do it because of how valuable it was. I've talked about the whole bullet debacle to death already, but yet again, the entire production aspect plays a crucial role throughout the entirety of All Out War, so not surprisingly, it is also the first thing they discuss. As for not destroying the equipment, I think this is one of those things that only really works in the bigger context of the comic story, since the latter half of the war in the books is more so about looking forward to what happens after Negan. And so, while it might have been a wise strategic decision, Eugene just thinks that after all of this is done, he would have regretted it. And the whole people burning out plot thread is also continued here. We see the confirmation that Rick is still completely fine, essentially cementing the fact that Dwight is still on their sides. I know fake out deaths like these are always a huge gamble and I can totally see why people be opposed to this one, but unlike the dumpster for example, I think the whole Dwight angle was already played up enough so that it more so seems like a important character reveal first and foremost rather than a fake out death. But I guess it's up to you how you feel about it. It's not the first time Kirkman has done these sorts of little cliffhangers. As for the show, as I briefly joked around before, in the midst of the whole hilltop conflict, Negan ends up in the trash folks base. And get out your surprised Pikachu faces, because yes, I really did not care for absolutely any of this. Neither on first viewing, nor in retrospect. Now that we know how this whole thing turns out, 
I do suppose it does somewhat hint at the rest of Negan's story, and some of the CRM and Anne's connections there, but like I've said many times already, I think all of this is pointless bloat, and unlike the excellent addition in the hilltop we just talked about, the trash folk are, in my opinion, the perfect example of how not to write filler. Not to mention how Negan literally never mentions anything about this helicopter to anyone ever again, but hey, I guess that is in character for Negan judging by the ending of the series. But not to dwell on the negative, because I'm in a positive mood today, let us get to yet another incredible addition, and that is the duo of Rick and Morgan. You might remember that back in Season 6, I said there was a severe lack of interaction between them. And I think this episode is a really, really good example of what I mean. Because what we got here are some of the most interesting push-pull dynamics between them that I think we've ever seen. The whole instigating event here is that the Savior prisoners escape the hilltop, and so Brick and Morgan go after them. But most importantly, the murder jacket has returned. So you already know what this means, right? What? Jokes aside, again, because this whole Prisoner of War plot is TV show exclusive, absolutely none of this happens in the book. That said, literally everything we see here is peak murder jacket Rick, and I will never forget watching this for the first time. Because seriously, this 10 second supercut alone describes this entire sequence perfectly. We'll give you a fresh start, a chance to become part of our community, to become one of us. Almost out, go on ahead. I lied. I know I famously say that this is my favorite scene and that is my favorite scene a million times, but seriously, the way this plays out has to be up there with some of Rick's best moments ever. Not to mention the inversion of several scenes we've seen before, with both Too Far Gone and the premiere of the season being evoked here. Now you put down your weapons, walk through those gates, you're one of us. A chance to become part of our community, to become one of us. I'm giving you my word. I'm giving you my word. Only this time, instead of someone else forcing him to make a move, it is Rick himself who unloads on them without as much as a second thought, and then explicitly saying, I lied. And it's these sorts of scenes that make me play out countless what-if scenarios in my head. What if Andrew Lincoln stuck around for season 9 and the whispers? What would that look like with Carl being gone? Could he once again be pushed back into the old murder jacket Rick? What if they did remix the ending of Season 8 and Rick just straight up kills Negan? What if Season 9 is akin to Season 4, where Rick has to take a step back from leadership as a whole? Obviously, all of these questions are for naught, but hey, fun to think about, I guess. Though probably the best moments here happen between Rick and Morgan. First off, the shot of Rick standing amidst the sea of bodies is just excellent. But once again, Rick reminding Morgan that he saved him, but asking why he did it, just pushing to understand why. Why'd you save me? You had your son there. No. Why'd you save me? Why? Because. And then that shot of Rick standing up against the cracked mirror. Oh, this is pure perfection. The acting from Lenny and Andrew here is nothing short of excellence. And knowing that the both of them leave the show at essentially the same time is just so heartbreaking in retrospect. Can you even imagine what could have been here with the whispers? But alright, without getting into the could've, would've, should've, I'll just say that I don't know what happened here, but with these last bits of season 8, I think the show finally reached the potential of what All Out War could've been. And that definitely deserves praise, though unfortunately, I think it was just too late for most people. And I think that would be particularly evident with Season 9, but let's not jump ahead. Returning to the book for a second, we get a brief scene with Carl and Mikey, who is grieving his father's death. In case you need a refresher, Mikey is the son of Nicholas, so they've known each other for quite a while now. Even if their initial interactions when Rick's group joined Alexandria were quite dicey. But that's beside the point. We see Carl walk up to him, saying that someone is going to tell him to get used to this, feeling sad and scared all the time. But he then says that he shouldn't listen, saying that he should hold on to that fear, remember it. Finishing by saying it's too easy to lose and that he's sorry his dad died. Personally, I think this single scene is enough to show just how much the two versions of Carl had diverged by this point, as the comic Carl is an absolute walking tragedy at this point. Keep in mind the little dude is like 10 or 11 years old here. 
and he is telling his friend to hold on to that innocence of fear and sadness as long as he can. You can tell me that isn't just straight messed up. Anyway, in the show, we've got a few more things to tackle before they converge back to the book. Notably, the drama between Negan and Trevor. Long story short, even aside from Trevor, drama is brewing within the sanctuary and all of that comes to a boiling point here. There is a band of saviors who are trying to revolt as is, then there is Simon leading the charge and on top of all of that, Dwight is also revealed to be an insider by Laura. Almost none of this happens in the book and the closest things we get is that small band of people that leave the sanctuary with Eugene. Obviously, Dwight is also there too, but we'll get to that in a second. As far as Simon vs. Negan goes, as much as I would have loved for Steven Ogg to stick around, I do think that this was basically the perfect capstone to the whole savior arc for them. Everything from Negan supposedly forgiving Simon to the whole Dwight double cross that happens, it was all some really interesting exploration of the hierarchy within the sanctuary that we never really explored in the source material. If anything, I am once again left asking why they didn't opt to just further delve into the savior side of the story and just scrap the entire trash folk. Get it? Scrap? Because it's it's trash, get it? It's, it's kind of like the same thing, funny. Because I don't think it's a hot take to say that they were far more interesting than the trash people who we barely ever saw. Hindsight is of course 2020, but whatever the case, I do think that this final stretch for the Sanctuary was probably among the best in the All Out War arc. And I might even go as far as to say that it was done better than the book. I think Kirkman did purposely keep a lot of the ongoings within the Sanctuary sort of unknown for the sake of drama, but with the likes of Simon, I do think that the show really improved on that. I also find it kind of amusing how evocative this horror ordeal is of Merle and the Governor, so that might actually be another reason why I enjoy it so much, but whatever the case, the whole fight was great. And before we return to the main plot, we also get to see some more Eugene drama as he's recaptured from the Sanctuary, then he throws up on Rosita to distract her and then returns back to the Sanctuary. Now, I'ma be honest, this portion of Eugene's story really seems all over the place and this seems like a misdirection for the sake of misdirection and frankly makes no sense. Obviously at first we're led to believe that Eugene is actually so scared that he has somewhat converted to Negan's side. Then, as we delve deeper into the Sanctuary story and what he's up to, he is blatantly still on the Survivor's side. Now, he is yoinked back by the survivors and appears to be in the middle, essentially fearing a retaliation from both sides. But then, as he returns to the sanctuary, he puts on this tough guy persona telling everyone to prep the bullets as soon as they can, once again going over the top to convince you that he is actually on Negan's side. But hey, once the open field thing happens, it turns out no, he was on the survivor's side all along. I get trying to make sure your cover isn't blown, but this whole ordeal seems like, number one, padding because it literally changes nothing, and number two, pretty blatantly tries deceiving the audience for the sake of shock factor. So yeah, some very odd decisions here if you ask me. Returning to the survivors though, to finish off the now season-long tradition of callbacks, we get one final one to punch us right in the gut. Rick and young Carl simply walking on a farm as some strings occasionally play. And as that fades into the up-close shots of walkers, the saviors, and then baby Gracie where Rick is once again forced to look back in the mirror. Cinematic perfection. Though aside from my weird sentimentality, this is one of those scenes that always seemed almost crowbarred in in how transparent it is. Rick sees himself in a mirror after he killed countless people. Okay, makes sense. But then he goes to take care of Gracie and sees himself in a mirror again. Which also calls back to when he saw himself in the mirror when he found her initially. So yes, that makes perfect sense. The mirror is a clear narrative tool forcing Rick to look back at himself and what he's become. But then, to finish it all off, Sadiq of all people walks in to conveniently plant that seed in his brain that he should forgive. With how much the Carl death was pushed to be the catalyst for Rick saving Negan, I just find it amusing how forced these scenes pushing Rick's change actually feel. Like, literally, if you removed Sadiq and Carl's death from this entire thing and him just looking in the mirror, I think the same exact outcome could be achieved. I think seeing an innocent baby that hasn't been affected by the brutality of the world and looking in the mirror to reflect on what you've become and how you have taken away this baby's parents, I think that hits hard as is. Especially considering that is literally what Rick has been doing since the very very start. 
But whatever the case, the scene with Carl is super bittersweet and it just makes me wonder how the story might have gone if they just recast Carl any number of times to keep up with his appropriate age. Though saying that, I can obviously also see the incredibly jarring feeling considering they need like 10 of them, but yeah, coulda woulda shoulda. The one thing that I absolutely loved here is the brief conversation we see between Rick and Morgan, who is still snapping in and out of his clear mode. Rick is trying to convince Morgan to stay behind, only for him to fire back saying that he needs to fight to keep these people alive, and then saying that the both of them are worse than they've ever been, referencing what happened at the bar as them crossing a line they hadn't yet. And oh boy, does this scene sting even harder knowing that Morgan is pushed to fear and literally becomes a different person. I mean, the story writes itself here. We have two men, both of whom lost their wives, both of whom lost their sons to walker bites, but then we see that, for Rick, Judith was still born and he found Michonne. Morgan, on the other hand, lost everything, including his trainer who largely saved him from himself. The number of different stories you could tell here about these two people who found themselves in near-identical circumstances, but walked two entirely different paths, is nuts. Though yeah, when taken in isolation, the scene is absolutely written and surprising nobody considering this is Lenny and Andrew acted out to perfection. And with that, it is time for the final confrontation of All Out War. I do admit, the way the episode actually unfolds is pretty interesting with many different things going on at the same time, but of course, it's just the big showdown that actually decides what happens here. The whole ambushing the ambushers who ambush you but you ambush them plan is entirely TV show exclusive, and as cool as it could have been, unfortunately, I think it is a very unsatisfying conclusion to the TV version of All Out War. Number one, I've been clowning on it ever since my season 8 coverage began, but yeah, the fact that this happens on a literal open field just seems incredibly dumb, and perhaps even worse, it's just boring. There's been memes about The Walking Dead always being set in a random forest for years, and literally the biggest confrontation of the past two seasons taking place on the most boring grassy field of all time certainly does not help it. Frankly, the most interesting thing about it is that this is the same filming location as Alpha's Border. That is literally it. But number two, the sheer number of people here on, again, a literal open field, seems like we briefly faded into the Battle of the Bastards instead of a zombie apocalypse. Number three, the whole guns backfiring and the whole ammo sabotage plan is actually really, really cool, but in classic all-out war fashion was turned to ridiculous Hollywood levels to the point that it makes no sense whatsoever. Because like, are you seriously telling me not a single gun, literally not a single one, had even a single live bullet in them? Not one among the hundreds and hundreds of saviors, all of whom have carried around their own weapons regularly? I get that Eugene was supposedly responsible for all of it, but again, not a single one? I'm not even going to get into the whole variety of guns and different caliber ammunition question because as far as I can tell, that was completely forgone. But yeah, personally, unfortunately, I found this whole thing super lackluster and just honestly a little bit dumb. That said, there is at least one fun scene. And before we follow up with what happens next, let us contrast it to the comic version. Remember that the Battle of Hilltop and this happened literally back to back. And so, now that Rick can't confirm that he is indeed fine, they begin making a retaliation plan. Because they expect Negan to have lowered his guard, they plan to regroup with Dwight and split Negan's forces in two. Though, soon after the backup team leaves, shots ring out once again and Negan is at the gates demanding a white flag. He says that he knows Rick is dead, to which Rick responds by casually walking out on his own. This obviously provokes Negan to yell at Dwight, saying that he's looking at a walking ghost, but Rick fires back saying to stop and that he needs to talk to him. And to show just how serious he is, Rick even adopts some of Negan's language, saying, let me put this into words you'll understand. <coughs> you. Trying to provoke Rick, Negan reminds him of Glenn, but Rick does not budge at all. Instead, he says something that catches Negan completely off guard, telling him, Let's do this right, let's work together. He begins explaining that the dead isn't the problem, even food isn't the problem. The problem is Negan and that this war is pointless. His eyes literally glisten as he starts talking about trade and social networks, saying they can rebuild civilization, maybe even better this time. 
Obviously, as we've seen before, for the comic book Rick, this is 100% his character. Many times already, we've already seen him be the only one to look past all the bad and peer into the future. Most of all, after they heard about the saviors originally and saw the hilltop. But Negan begins to realize that yes, with such an agreement, they could easily maintain a safe zone between them. They could trade and travel easily, finally saying, oh. You're right. Again, keep in mind that the purpose of the Sanctuary at its very core was always people are a resource. In the book, we don't really see Negan be so trigger happy as to burn doctors and whatnot. So this is Rick just bonking Negan over the head with his own philosophy. And surprise surprise, Carl doesn't need to die for that to happen. But as Negan mulls this over in his head, Rick catches him off guard and slices his throat open because to him, he is a cannon that he simply cannot keep under control. We'll talk about this specific decision more in just a moment, but the show plays out quite similarly to the book, only instead of Rick pitching anything, he initially goes in with a pretty explicit intention of killing Negan that later turns into a pitch. Now, I do admit, in terms of further characterizing Negan, I do think that Rick stunning him by bringing up Carl is a pretty neat way of handling this scene. But I feel like killing Carl to achieve this is like using a jet engine to make toast. Sure, it might get the work done quickly, but it's a bit overkill and you might be left with a piece of charcoal. But yeah, despite the debatable story implications for the 500th time, I do absolutely think that JDM and Andrew seriously carry this scene. Because for both of them, the amount of emotions we see on their faces is just something else entirely. And of course, I have to mention Lauren here as well. Because as Rick tells them to save him and Maggie just begins screaming at the top of her lungs that no, he killed Glenn, it's the most heartbreaking thing ever. No, he can't! No! No, he killed Glenn! Just how raw this whole thing is with that single note echoing on as Maggie just screams that it's not over until he's dead? Pure perfection. And oh, the rest of the scene. If the climax of the war was a complete letdown, then the final moments made up for it in droves for me. Everything from the soundtrack to the editing as we stay with Rick, where those teary eye shots come full circle. And let me reference something most of you won't know, but it's almost like Velen's sigh of relief at the end of Legion. It's so, so simple, but just a single sigh can convey so much more than you could ever put into words. And Rick just sitting there, mumbling, my mercy prevails over my wrath, it's just beautiful. And side note, reportedly, this was actually one of Rick's planned exits. But because we've still got a ton of comic story to cover, we'll get to all of those in the Season 9 coverage. Returning to the book though, unlike the show where the cut was literally across his neck, Rick only got Negan on the side as he fell back. So as he presses the wounds, Negan still has some fight in him. And fair warning, I have literally no idea how realistic this is, and how long Negan would realistically actually be able to fight, but maybe because this is a comic book, my suspension of disbelief was already much more pronounced. So until the moment I literally started working on this video, I never really thought about it much. But anyway, Negan grapples with Rick mid-sentence and as they begin throwing down, the backup group also begins ambushing the saviors. And a absolutely brilliant scene we get here is Dwight shooting a savior to save King Ezekiel, but telling him to quickly hide the bolts. So we immediately see some politics being played here as well. Because obviously, revealing that Dwight was a double agent all along has a much lower chance of actually ending this war. He needs to appear as the leader of the saviors to stop this thing. As for Rick and Negan, because Rick in the comic just can't catch a break, Negan literally snaps his leg 90 degrees until he finally loses consciousness. And now, with the head honcho down, Dwight, very symbolically, picks up Lucille and commands everyone to stand down, saying that this war is over. And just like the show, Rick just yells out, save Negan, don't care about me, I will live, you have to save him. In the book, Maggie's outburst isn't quite as intense as it is in the show, but Rick is quite literally the only one wanting to keep him alive. With Andrea, Carl, and Maggie all saying that he can seriously mean to keep him alive. But we then cut to Rick making an official speech to address the communities, announcing that the war is over and that they now need to stand united for what comes next. 
And following his speech, we get a brief conversation between Michonne and him about how people's spirits seem to be high. But Michonne then asks, why would Rick go back to Alexandria? Because, you know, it kinda burned down. In the show, this whole new beginning vibe is extended to all the communities, as we see Eugene fixing up the solar panels, trade routes being established, and so on. So, it's a bit more expanded in the show, and more so implicit instead of them actually talking about it. But, as Andrea walks in, Rick asks whether she's seen Carl. And, big surprise, as they make it to Negan's bedside, Carl is very inconspicuously chilling there, and Rick immediately tries talking him down. He tells Michonne and Andrea to leave him alone with Carl, and he essentially just repeats what we've heard many times before. They are better than this. Even Negan let them live when he had the chance to kill them. This is a new beginning, and Carl just needs to move on. And so, despite his initial protests, he says, fine. And that's when the big reveal happens. Rick turns to Negan, casually asking, you're awake, aren't you? Now, I know the decision of whether or not to kill Negan has been a long-standing talking point, but my read on it was always that this isn't some heroic decision on Rick's part. Only far, far later would the hatred toward Negan begin to subside and he'd be given another chance. But here, this is not mercy at all. I always read it as Rick giving Negan the worst kind of punishment he could ever have. This is Negan after all, someone who ruled like a king. But now, he is going to be thrown in a cell with bare necessities and nothing more. Just to sit there for days, weeks, months, years. Just sitting there as a shining example of what happens if the balance is upset. Even from a realism point of view, Negan ought to have some loyal followers who didn't turn right away. Something we would in fact see in Season 9. So keeping him imprisoned is just a constant reminder of what can happen. So yeah, my personal read on all of this was always that this is worse than death, and Rick knows it. And another very nice detail in the book here is that Rick has almost absorbed a part of Negan, simply telling him, you are f <coughs> Unfortunately, because AMC censored all of that, that whole language aspect is just lost in the adaptation. And I know somebody's going to be mad about me censoring it as well, but please don't compare me to a billion dollar company. Me censoring things on my silly little YouTube video is not really the same as a billion dollar company censoring a mature show with plenty of gore running at an evening time slot. But yes, in terms of the bigger all out war story, that is where it ends. But in the show, we've still got to send off all of our friends to their own spin offs, so let's speedrun any percent Daryl's forgiveness. Okay, we're done here. I'm off to look for Sherry. Kachow. Okay, now Morgan's going to see Jadis. Oh, no, he'll stay here. Oh, no, he's going to leave. Oh, no. Okay, I'm starting to get a little bit delirious talking about Season 8, but jokes aside, when the season was originally airing, I won't lie, I was actually super excited to see how their stories might play out with them moving over to Fear the Walking Dead. Especially after the absolute gem that was Season 3. But, yeah. Unfortunately, that did not age well. I was expecting some sort of crossover where maybe the Clark family would turn out to be villains, but yeah, no. That's a whole can of worms I won't open, but especially with Morgan, who I thought had finally gotten the much-deserved spotlight, unfortunately, this is their send-off. Oh yeah, and speaking of this, apparently Lenny James was pretty disappointed by the lack of actual screen time he got in the series, so I think that just further proves my point. But yes, with that, that is Season 8 and the many ups and downs of All Out War. A pretty unusual arc when it comes to adapting the source material, with both drastic departures and almost one-for-one -one moments. But all things considered, I think it just found its footing way too late. And to clue you in on the behind-the-scenes stuff a little bit, I fully expected this, but last time I already got a few comments about how my coverage has leaned toward the negative. But like I said way back when I began the series, that is just how I honestly feel about it, and when I feel differently, like I do with most of the latter half of the season, I will praise it with stars in my eyes, because yes, I am still a Walking Dead Turbo nerd. I mean, it's in the title, right? The whole reason why I started the series is to look back at it through a retrospective lens. All of it, including the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, if you expected constant praise, then I'm sorry, this is not the series for you. I'm just being honest how I feel about it. But alright, we've been here for long enough, so I just want to give a very heartfelt thank you for sticking with me through the arduous Negan saga. 
And now that the show has actually concluded, your continued support means an absolute ton. But my sappiness aside, let's look ahead as next time we'll be delving into a new beginning. And that's the video. Apologies for the delay, I wrote about it in the community posts, but I am dealing with some health complications. So my usual editing schedule is a little jumbled up and will probably be so for the foreseeable future. But hopefully we'll be back on track, at least relatively soon. Though with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest member of the team, Lloyd Robotum. I am sorry if I butchered your name. But without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, especially in times of YouTube making even more restrictive changes. So seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.